Hey everyone and welcome to another special broadcast with Parents and Baby Brunch. Today, South Africa's Dr. Tlaleng Mofeking, medical doctor, specialist on sexual and reproductive health, social media influencer, as well as educator, joins us on Parents and Baby Brunch. A big thank you to FedHealth. At FedHealth Medical Aid, nothing's more important than the well-being of your baby and little one, which is why our FlexiFed 2 and 3 plans enrich your pregnancy and parenting experience with benefits like unlimited GP visits, a doula benefit, a private ward for delivery, trauma treatment in a casualty ward, and our free FedHealth baby program. To get more choice, flexibility, and control from your growing family's medical aid, call FedHealth today. FedHealth, we let you be you. Doctor, it's wonderful to have your time today. And I'm going to get straight into it. The last time we spoke, uh, I asked you, where are you? And you let me know that you have gone home to rest, to take some time out. And I want to know, keeping in mind home, what did sexual health mean to you growing up? Um, Dr. Tlaleng Mufuking, Wanagwagwa. You know, because that 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 it, those are my roots. That's who I am, um, and that place made me. And for a long time, growing up in my home, I didn't know that other young women like me, my own friends, my peers, were not talking openly to their moms about sex and their bodies and menstruation. And it was really only when I got to boarding school when I realized how different my home had been. Mm -hmm. um, and all along, I thought I was a cool kid and I was popular. But it turns out that all my friends were there for my mom. She was the cool one. She was the popular one because she really was just so honest and firm and positive mm -hmm. um, about us as young women, our growth, our development and our inquisitiveness. So home for me is that place that really just centers me and gathers me. We're in a place now where, I mean, a new year has started last year. COVID took over our lives. Um, I think we can better manage things at the moment. When you think of your importance, your role as an educator, as a doctor, when it comes to sexual health, women and men, what's your position now? Look, it was very interesting when COVID happened, right? Um, and the president had that uh, press uh, uh, briefing and he said no kissing. And people are like, what? What do you mean? And he left it at bay. <laughs> so I was left to field all sorts of questions and, 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 and you know, and, and from people from all sorts of life saying, but Dr. T, what did the president really mean by no kissing during COVID? And because we knew that COVID was, um, you know, uh, transmitted through droplets, um, it was important to give that information. But what it meant, especially for people in long-term relationships, uh, people who are married, uh, people who are exploring their own new relationships, literally had to find information about how do we navigate sex and sexuality in this time and intimacy became something that i spoke about a lot mm -hmm. to say that we can validate our relationships and not necessarily through only sexual interactions but there are so many other ways of being intimate and showing and expressing love um, especially a lot of healthcare providers who by their work were at risk of COVID 19. so what did it mean for them although they were not traveling but every day by going to work to a hospital clinic they were at an increased risk and their partners needed to understand that and find ways as couples to be intimate and to really find you know that that comfort for themselves but touch is so important it's something that we love and like i mean i remember thinking the one day all i want is a hug you know never mind intimacy maybe that is also intimacy you know when we were kids they used to say touch is a move <laughs> you know <Yeah>. imply <laughs> implying you can't just touch the boy's hand and expect nothing to happen <laughs> We all grew up in the same households, clearly. <laughs> Why do they say you're a loud mouth? I saw that in an interview and I was like, just because you're speaking out about things that matter, tell me quickly about that because I want to put it behind me. You know, I, and I love that label. I embrace that label. And if I was seen as docile, as a lady, as respectable, I would probably, I would, I would lose it. I don't want to project all of those labels because society... Uh, you know, is engineered. And then even as young women, as girls, um, you know, we are punished for speaking our minds, for, for, for asserting ourselves, for knowing who we are. And I think being referred to as loud is so affirming because for the longest time, um, even if you think of like racial or even of, of gender prejudice, most of us were judged for being too loud even in the classroom. You are speaking too loud, you are laughing too mm. loudly. Um, and I think for me, it's such an empowering place to know that I'm going against what society expects me to dim my own light and to be shy about who I am. And I insist 
on even assisting other young women and motivating them to speak up and stand in their light. And if being a loud mouth is what it is, then so be it, because it means you are affirmed, you know what you want, and you can assert yourself. Your passion for women's health, how did that come about? It came about, and, 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 and funny enough, now it's in retrospect, right? Because when you start doing interviews, you are kind of forced to think about the genesis. Mm. And I think it was literally because I had all this information that my peers never had. I started to be a peer educator in inverted mm. commas to my own friends and my own peers. And again, in boarding school, a lot of them were asking questions and I'm like, but I, I thought we all knew this. I thought we all knew how to break up with boys. I thought we all knew um, that you can kiss someone and it can stop there. It doesn't imply anything else. Mm -hmm. And so I started to be this sort of go in between, between my friends and my peers and my mom. Because when I got stuck, I would phone her and be like, hey, sissy, this is what my friends are asking. Yeah. Do you mind speaking to my one friend? They can't speak to their mom, but you know, there, there's some issues that they need to talk about. Mm -hmm. And she became sort of that reference for me. And, and in my medical school years, um, senior years, we had this family medicine project and we had to decide what we're going to do in that attachment. And I decided to go to a rural town in the Eastern Cape and, and, and meet with the clinic staff there, assist them and, and, and train them in how to do sex positive history taking and create an environment that's enabling for the youth. And that was like in 2006, five, six. Um, and this, this even language of sex positivity was not even a thing yet, you know, right. um, and I'm quite blessed in that I was able to, to see my passion um, and it was, it, it, it merged with something I was really good at, which is talk to people um, and, and being a young medical doctor, I suppose, you know, at the time gave me the credibility that you need for good information, right? A lot of young people, unfortunately, don't have that in their home um, and so they don't have really credible sources. And that's why I think even now, you know, I, I still do radio, TV. TV print, um, you know, hosting my own TV baby show. Brunch. Because, <laughs> baby brunch, here we go, right? Um, because of that, uh, yeah. because of just that natural ability to talk to people about sex without shame, without stigma, um, without discrimination. It's interesting that you make the reference to 2006 because still today, us as parents find it hard and challenging. And here we get to your questions and the things that you wanted to ask Dr. T. How can we as parents make sure that our children are comfortable, the same kind of relationship that you could have with your mom. And I must admit, I have that relationship with my children and I had it with my mother. So I don't know if it's, you know, how you break the rhythm of silence or being quiet or make it come. But what can you teach moms and dads in this webinar? How do we go about teaching our young ones about their bodies? You cannot give your children what you don't have. So if you don't have good information about your own body, about your own sexual health, about consent, about respect for your space and other people's space, you can't give that to children. In fact, you will be projecting all of these values that you actually don't want them to have. So I always say with parents, when you are unsure, when you are uncertain, don't lash out on your children. Take that moment and step back and think, why is this question that my child is asking me making me so uncomfortable? They may be triggering other experiences that you have buried long time ago. They may be challenging you into spaces you, you are yet to explore for yourself. Don't be shy to say to your child, I'm actually not quite sure. Mm -hmm. If it's a health or medical related question, book your child an appointment with your local nurse. A lot of our pharmacies, um, local pharmacies um, have, have nurses in them. Book your child with a doctor and go with them to say, ask the doctor, ask the nurse, what more do you want to know? And engage in that process together because you are building trust and your child knows that you don't know everything and it's okay to not know, but it's how you seek information and creating that open communication with your children. Don't, don't judge them. Don't shout at them when they're asking you about boys, about kissing. How did I come to this world? How are babies made? Those are all natural questions that children are inquisitive about um, and, and find ways that you can truly embrace who your children are. But I really do think it starts with you having to unlearn some of the negative and bad things we were taught and then learning with your children step by step, holding each other's hands um, along the way. You're saying all the things I love. This is so good. Because <laughs> my next question was going to be around our teenagers, right? So I, I have teenagers and then I have littlies as well. And my next question was going to be how to how to engage with teens, you know, because they're watching us and they see our behaviors and we want to raise wholesome and amazing children. You just talked about collaboration and going to with your child to the health care specialist or whoever. 
There's a book that I read that talks about how to raise successful people. And it talks about trust and collaboration. You can't just tell your kid, you know, you go and do sport if you are not doing it yourself. So um, do you have a message for our teens? I do. Um, and, and and I know a lot of our teens are in that space where they, they are exerting and asserting their independence right and there's this fire deep within their bellies that as caregivers and parents we need to nurture and we need to remember what it was like when we were teens right the hormones are happening um you know the girls are, are their bodies are changing <laughs> right and what all of that comes with and then there's the pressure of of, of of socialization right and peer pressure and fitting in um and then there are those children who are experiencing some difficulties right and breaking and forming in those years and they need support and holding of the hand as well. So I think for our teenagers is just to affirm that what they are going through, the questioning, those feelings of just feeling so irritated with your parents mm. because oh they're so slow or you just oh, did an eye roll. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> no, can you see I've I've written I've I've, re- no, I've received those eye roll. <laughs> From my patients to the like, oh, dog, please. It's called whatever, whatever. And I'm like, okay, fine, you know. Um, and 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 so it's about just trusting the process um, and really just affirming and creating the safer space. I would rather your children come to you mm-hmm. for anything yes. than be so scared and terrified of you as a parent that they have to rely on other children, their friends, and perhaps even at worst, people and strangers on the internet which are just sitting there waiting to prey on our children so please as parents rather Mm -hmm. invest in creating and being that safer space for your children and for children and those who are teenagers please just understand that you will figure it all out just take a deep breath it will be okay (laughs) and buy the book we're going to talk about it in a while (laughs) (laughs) dr t i know that you have a passion for family planning now, it's a, it's a, and I have to say this in the special broadcast, Dr. T is here to assist us with some information. So the rest is in her book and you can consult your healthcare practitioner or you can make an appointment with her if you need to know more. We're literally just scratching the surface. So when it comes to family planning, where do you start? I mean, is it something that you discuss before the marriage? I'll tell you why. Last year, we had a conversation around will and testaments. And the experts said to us, you know what, if you're going to knock on the door of divorce by creating your prenup, you might as well knock on the door of death and set up your will and testament. And now I want to go further and say, you might as well knock on the door of parenting and, yeah. and speak to spouse or partner about possibly having children, even though you are just getting married. You know, that's probably one of the things you want to discuss beforehand. In your opinion and experience, being in the field of planning families, what would you say? When, when's the right time to start that conversation? Once you've decided that this may be a potential long-term partner, whatever the arrangement is, you know, a lot of us now don't get married immediately, right? Mm. But there is some established long-term partnership that's happening here. And I think at that point, you need to discuss things like finances, definitely, and of course, issues of families, whose responsibility is it to be on a contraceptive, and and how long are we going to wait as we plan, and and what are the, the, the deal breakers? in relationships. And I think children and the the ability to have children is one of the important ones. Mm -hmm. And often when we think of planning families, we don't think about the pleasure of sex. And so people are having sex just to have children. And in between, (laughs) there isn't much else. Exactly. There isn't much else enjoyment for what it is, right? And and, and I'm Catholic and the Pope recently spoke about the pleasure of food and sex, about how even as a human species, we have over-regulated our ability to experience pleasure from sex. And he says that sex is for procreation, but it is divine and it's for enjoyment. And that's mm. the message that I just want to carry through. And, and some of my, my cousins and, 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 and good friends of mine are Catholic priests. And they use my book, in fact, um, to talk about, you know, sex and sexuality and pleasure with couples during premarital counseling. So mm. find that place, that expert, that, that, that professional who can take you through these questions with your partner. And if it's a religious or faith-based person, 
find someone who's affirming for both of you. Right. Um, and, and again, you know, some of us are traditionalists, right? Naki mm. uh, So perhaps for me, it's my older aunt, right? Mm. Marahadi or, or, or Mangwani. And you, those are the people that you go to for this type of advice. Uh, but find the space. And if you need to get a second opinion, when some people tell you things that you don't quite understand, it's okay find the person, take the time to find that resource um, that's credible and that's good for you and, and your mm -hmm. values and they're in line and in tune with what the life you are trying to create as a couple. Dr. T, you make it so easy to talk about this and, you know, there, there's songs written about this. Let's talk about sex, baby. And, you know, there's... <laughs> There's, I laughed in your book, by the way, right at the beginning, she's describing like what kind of book and she's like, this is not that kind of book. You know, like if you're going to look for pictures, you're going to have to find it elsewhere. Um, we, we'll talk about that now. I'm just so excited about it. When it comes to, we just talked about intimacy and baby and that there needs to be pleasure in sex. I mean, we can find all this information and we've just talked about the handbook literally, but how do we keep passion as the goal in mind, even though you want baby? Someone once said to me, obsession makes us stupid. You know, you want baby. You, what are you thinking about is baby. How do we keep the passion in mind without being, without killing the moment, just making it about family planning? Mm. And I always say to a lot of women, because unfortunately we are the ones who are still burdened with, um, you know, the, proving fertility, having these children, yeah. and our bodies are designed, right, to grow these little beings. And so it's important to still keep up with your annual examinations and your check-ins with your doctor or your health provider, because you need to know that at best you are healthy, that there aren't any medical conditions that mm. we need to actively manage, like fibroids, like endometriosis, yes, um, any other gynecological or hormonal issues that may impact on your ability to get pregnant, you know, like polycystic ovarian syndrome, mm. which many of us um, in, 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 in the African continent are suffering with. So if you know that you've had your checkup, your pep smear screening has come back normal, you don't have any sort of physical medical issues why you can't get pregnant, I think it's best to say, don't stress about it. When you are ovulating and we know that you ovulate and we know, which is something I have to remind everyone, remember to make a pregnancy, you need healthy quality sperm as well. So it's no use just focusing on the mm. woman or the person with the uterus. We need to make sure that the sperm count is normal, that the sperm that's there is healthy and it's able to swim properly. Mm. So both of you need to be on a great diet, decrease your know, smoking, which can impact you know, your quality of eggs, decrease on the alcohol intake, which also can impact mm. not only just your libido and your desire, but also on the quality generally of your cardiovascular system as well. So when you know that medically you are clear, you, you're going to have to just enjoy it because the stress hormone is really bad for pregnancy. Okay. People who stress about pregnancy find it even harder to fall pregnant. And I'll give you a funny story very quickly. There's been research done globally that shows that parents who then become adoptive parents after a long time of trying to have sex, who have been noted to have high stress levels associated with trying to get pregnant, fall pregnant quickly after adopting a child. I've seen because this. Because now they are released. Yes. They are relaxed. They are no more worried about, you know, trying to get pregnant, trying to have this baby. And suddenly, because everything is just so relaxed, psychologically, mentally, the, 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 the energy in the home is different. They then get pregnant with their own biological child. So there is some science, you know, to stress and the impact of, of stress um, on, on our ability to, to be fertile, to get pregnant. And really, we have to remember that sex is more than just procreation but mm -hmm. procreation is as a result of sex and you know it will happen it will happen and if it doesn't seek help quicker and make sure that both the woman and the men get screening for infertility right you're you are so reassuring thank you um doctor these are quick ones i mean we don't have to stay with them these are some of the questions we got i added to some of your questions so thanks for allowing me to do that uh, what causes libido changes during pregnancy? Uh, some of us have the desire, you know, it's like now and others feel not now. Yeah, it is normal um, to have these variations. 
definitely some people enjoy sex much more, some people not quite as much. And even if they have the libido for it, they just don't enjoy it as much. And I remember with, with pregnancy, it's not an abnormal situation. It's just that physiologically, there are changes that happen. Your blood volume increases, the legs can be swollen, um, you are physically heavy because of this abdomen. So even the technique you are using to have sex can sometimes either make you turned off a little bit or enjoy it a bit more. So I always say to women, when you are pregnant, even if the belly is not so big yet, use a pillow underneath your abdomen so that you are sort of helping to cushion that pressure so that sex is not completely uncomfortable for you. Change the type of positions that you are enjoying and experiment perhaps in different ones. And always speak to your doctor to make sure that you can engage wonderfully and pleasurably in sex because some conditions around the cervix um, can make sex contraindicated, especially early on. And so depending on what medical underlying, um, you know, conditions you have, your doctor may say, in fact, go ahead, have fun or slow down a little bit. There's a few things we need to check out. And if in doubt, if in doubt, stop. If you are in too much pain, if there's vaginal dryness that perhaps you are worried about, ask your doctor if and which preparations you can use. Don't take over the counter stuff um, or, or sexual pleasure enhancers when you are pregnant because we know that they can have an, an impact on you as well as the growing fetus. And again, sex can be pleasurable during pregnancy, but for those who don't quite enjoy it, it's also okay and normal. And let's find other ways of being intimate with your partner. There are other ways of, 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 of remaining physically intimate without necessarily having penetration, but absolutely the hormonal changes absolutely affect your libido, your enjoyment, and the physical changes too. Another question that asks, so when can I start having sex again after baby? So we always give the six-week rule. And that six-week rule is just to allow your body um, to do what it needs to do. The hormones are flushed out because now this fetus is out of you um, and you have this healthy baby. You are trying to understand your own body and, and the post-pregnancy blues. You know, sometimes some people have that. And, and, and literally, depending on the type of birthing you had, if you have a vaginal birthing, there may be some healing that needs to happen around that area. You may have an episiotomy. You may have some stitching. That, that also needs to heal. If you had a cesarean section, um, you also again have that abdominal scar that itself is still quite tender and sensitive. So you don't want to interfere with the healing process. Mm -hmm. A lot of scarring can happen if you rush to have sex too quickly. Your, your, your stitches or your staples may actually then just open up and cause um, you know, secondary wound, wound um, conditions. And I think for us, the six week mark um, is what we really just say as a general rule. There may be women even at that time um, still do not feel like having sex. You may still try to get into your routine with a new baby. And so you do need to take the time that you need to allow your body. And I always say this to Ilana, to a lot of women, it can take up to two years for mm. you to start feeling like your old self again. And I think to be gentle, to be kind with each yeah. other is the most important thing um, that I can say, especially around this period. Your mental health is really important. Um, you are taking care of a newborn and you have no idea what you're doing either, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we need supportive partners who are kind and gentle and generous and able to do this co co as, as partners. And let's do it together. Um, and I think that enhances the relationship and intimacy. And therefore, you may very well then want to, um, you know, take things to the next level when you feel that care and kindness from your partner. Doctor, my next question was going to be around mood enhancers uh, for to keep your partner happy. I think you touched on it that one shouldn't really do that when you are pregnant. What about after pregnancy? Is that something that you recommend? Um, that people enhance the feeling of wanting to have sex or being intimate? I always say, especially in the reproductive years of our lives, I mean, especially for women, we, of course, go through pre-teen mood and puberty happens and all these hormones come rushing in. And then you are a, a young or an older woman where you kind of have that stable phase. And then you get perimenopausal where your hormones are starting to change again. And then you get into the postmenopausal phase. Your body is doing very different things throughout those phases. And so your, your ability to be aroused, your sexual desire, your ability to have vaginal um, lubrication naturally um, is impacted by so many other things. You may have thyroid disease. You may have a mood disorder like uh, major depression or um, 
any other mental health um, disorders. You may have financial stress, right, and other social stressors that impact your body very differently. And it's very important um, to remember that before you medicalize your condition, please find out what is the right diagnosis. Mm so that you don't just take over the counter medication when you actually have underlying important health conditions that need to be managed. That's why that annual checkup is so important. The other thing is that there are antidepressants that can affect your libido or your desire for sex. Mm. There are other treatments like um, other chronic uh, medications, like hypertension, diabetic, that can affect your sexual health and well-being. So going for over-the-counter medication is not something that I encourage. A lot of people, especially who have uh, male sexual dysfunction or erect erectile dysfunction, research has shown us that by the time you have erectile dysfunction, you have some underlying cardiovascular disease. Oh, so wow. it's no use getting enhancers that are just going to work at stimulating you when you're actually not treating underlying heart-related issues because that, in fact, may make it worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good advice. Now, Dr. Foreplay, I'm almost shy asking it. Is it important? Can't we just read a book and pray? What, what do you say when couples come and see you and they want to know, you know, we don't just want to just start or get into it. How important is foreplay? Foreplay is very important. Um, I think it's important to set the scene of what's about to happen. I think it's important um, to affirm that we both are present and we are mm. here and we consent to what's about to happen. I think foreplay is also good as a litmus test for communication in relationships. Because if you are not communicating, people find foreplay quite like rigid and scary because, mm. oh my gosh, what are we supposed to be doing and saying to each other? So <laughs> I always say, always, 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 take that moment for foreplay because it's it's helpful in affirming and and everyone wants to be desired foreplay mm -hmm. is not only just for women mm -hmm. it's also for men and i always say to my patients and especially those people who come for sex therapy who are men i say we need to normalize men feeling desired mm -hmm. we need to normalize that and normalize the fact that we need to be checking in with each other the fact that consent is ongoing mm -hmm. it involves what needs to be done, where I like being done and giving each other feedback in the moment right. because foreplay is great because then when you know what you are anticipating, when you know um, what your partner sort of expects from you and you know that they will tell you if something is going great or not, you are less anxious and you are able to really enjoy yourself um, in that moment. And that's what's it's really important. And you can talk about, are we using condoms? Are we not using condoms? Mm -hmm. All of that is happening in that foreplay period. And it's very important um, to set the right scene in the context um, for what's about to happen. And consent is important because without mm -hmm. consent, there is no pleasure. I love your, your response about ongoing consent. You know, that, and, and that was going to be a question of mine, but I, I think you covered it beautifully. And, and the way you speak about our bodies is so respectful and so easy. Um, Doctor, I want to talk about this book now. So I, I downloaded mine on Kindle. So thanks for being on Kindle because, yeah, I got it last year for my birthday. So tell us about Dr. T, A Guide to Sexual Health and Pleasure. Wait, I want to, I want to read you a little bit right at the beginning. This is what I enjoy. When women are able to hold conversations and negotiate the type of sex they want, including the use of condoms, toys, fantasy play, within respectful exchanges, the chances of good and affirming sexual experiences are greater. It is my wish, so doctor's wish, that you find a guide to sexual health and pleasure informative and that you keep it as a reference tool that, keeps you, that, that you keep going back to it and can assist in getting the best out of it while you consult uh, with your healthcare practitioner face to face to face. I enjoyed that because it's almost like you're saying, go through this book. And then when you go and see your healthcare professional, you can ask questions around this as well because you've worked through it. People, would assume, people would assume that a book is a natural progression for a passionate, informed, educator, representative 
people people that work on rules in South Africa, in government, in parliament, you know, people would say it's a natural progression, but I look at this and I'm thinking you're helping so many people. You are helping. And I took the time. Yeah. You're helping so many people. So I'm going to ask you why a book? And it's so important because I could have written this book any other time, mm. um, but I, I needed to, to find the, the space for it firstly in terms of time, but also the vulnerability that I needed to, 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 to be at myself, mm. right? And there are stories that I share in that book that I have never shared with anyone. Um, and even in writing this book and thinking about issues of consent, I had to reckon with my own moments mm. where I was feeling completely disempowered um, during a sexual um, you know, interaction and what that meant for me, right? Mm. Um, and, and realizing the fact that actually some moments I hadn't quite wanted to accept as abuse and, and, and what they were, and they were. And I had to process that. And that book for me was important to take that time because I wanted it to be authentic. I wanted to share parts of myself with the reader um, because I think that's part of, 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 of who I am. You know, I, 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 I share and, 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 and I always share my own experiences to, to show people that you, you, you are not alone in a lot of these questioning and navigating of life. We are all going through this, but it needed me to take that time and also to learn, you know, the subjects I speak about, um, you know, have taken time to formulate some of the concepts, you know, we are still developing and building as practitioners um, and human rights defenders, even in the field of sexual and productive health rights. Um, and I needed to just take the time to myself be a student and, and with all the radio work and the TV work and, and, you know, that column that I had for many years in the Sunday papers um, was important to then culminate in the book and not do the book first because I wanted to respect the process mm. of learning, um, of, of, of changing myself, going through all of those. Um, as someone who experienced, you know, some infertility and had to get some treatment too, I think it was important to share some of those um, and I needed to take the time um, to get to that good space. 2021 is, and it could be a very long year, keeping 2020 in mind. What do you want to say to all our parents who are listening to this conversation and perhaps are revisiting it on our podcast platform and want to hear you speak again? What kind of reassurance about our bodies and our children working in this field can you give us to end this conversation? So I just want to say congratulations because you are surviving a global pandemic a world disaster um, in our lifetime. Mm. And just for surviving that, I need, we need to give us, I mean, I'm getting goosebumps as I say yeah. that, we need to give ourselves, gosh, a break, um, you know, but we need to be thankful for the life that we have um, and, and live intentionally and purposefully and be kind to each other. I think a lot of what we are struggling with, um, you know, even within our families, within our relationships with each other as parents, children, um, it, it's just sometimes it lacks a little bit of kindness and mm. patience. And that's what I would say. I'm encouraging you to be patient with each other, to be kind with each other, um, and really remember that not only are you trying to survive a pandemic and are surviving a pandemic, but you are also trying to be productive at work. You are trying to make sure that there's a roof over your children's heads, um, that, you know, there's food on the table, and all of that can be quite stressful um, and so my my dedication my commitment always is to create a world that all of us can thrive and more than just survive we've been surviving for far too long um, we deserve to thrive we deserve to step up um, into that light of our higher selves and and if there's any way that i can contribute and i have chosen of course the field of sexual health uh, and pleasure and rights I think we will all be amazing because you do what you do as a broadcaster and you do it so well mm -hmm. as someone who's building communities and holding other women and creating the space. And if all of us can, like you, create little moments of light in the lives of others, that light can coalesce and become a bigger light. And before we know it, we will have a country that we know we deserve and we will ho we'll have homes and families that we know we deserve. And it's in all of us to create that. Dr. T, this was amazing. <laughs> you, are, you are just a ray of light. Thank you for being born and for giving us so much reassurance and your blessings. When you speak, you speak of light. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. You have to buy the book. It's called 
Dr. T, a guide to sexual health and pleasure. Dr. T is helping many people all around the world. Thank you for choosing South Africa. You chose us. <laughs> I'm yours. I'm yours. And you are You're mine. mine. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time, because she promised to be back. Did you hear that? Okay. Until next time. Bye, doctor. Bye. Thank you.